Welcome to Crimson Guitars, welcome to my home studio, and welcome to my entry into the great guitar build-off of 2020. I am having a total blast. I am also somewhat cacking it because this is the penultimate episode, and I have currently got, like, my guitar is at about 20 pieces or more. Burn it. Ah, yay! The oval is going to be made out of strips of mother of pearl. I think that's all right. What do you think? Obviously, this is only the barest beginning of what I'm after. In this episode, you are going to see me finalize what I'm going to do on the neck. People have been talking about neck dive, and I'm going to be taking away some material. Although there is still quite a lot here, I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. The thing with neck dive is you can always change where the strap button is, if you have anywhere to drill the strap button into, that is. This competition is all about Winning. raising money for charity. This guitar is going to be raffled off by greatguitarbuildoff.com for the Trussell Trust, which is uh, a UK charity for, uh, they run food banks and are about ending poverty and hunger in the UK. The other builders involved in the official competition all have their own charities and good causes, and I implore you to go and check them all out. GreatGuitarBillOff.com is where this is all being run by. Crimson Guitars are sponsoring it with kits and airtime and um, prizes and organizational stuff and that, but uh, we are not making any money out of it directly. That is uh, all of the money that is raised apart from um, any processing fees by the credit, comp credit card companies, etc. Uh, all go to the charity. So yeah, this is great fun. And then there is the secondary competition, the Great Guitar Build Along. We have, I think, 80 official entries into the unofficial uh, into, the, into the side contest so far, and uh, that is pretty awesome. The top five are going to get um, airtime on Crimson Guitar's channel. Their video will be played as a standalone video on our channel, and uh, the top three get um, kits and tools and isotunes and uh, various other bits and pieces. So uh, if you're remotely interested in joining in that competition, that's running for a couple of months from now. So check it out. I have got to nip the fret ends off, carve the neck, do a little bit more grinding, grinding and carving uh, inside of the body. I had random thoughts flitting through my brain uh, of maybe gold leafing it or copper leafing the entire thing. Time constraints notwithstanding, I actually really like the look of this. Under finish, it's a little bit darker and uh, I think I'm just gonna leave it like this. There is of course the top surface to sort out and uh, and the insides, those need texture. I'm going to put in my isotunes. Don't forget, Crimson 10, get yourself 10 pounds off or $10 off, depending on where you are. What I'm doing is I'm gonna grind the texture on the internal calves of this and just think a little bit more about the rest of my day. Cheerio. And here we are. Just a little bit of texture. Only that much more to do. I cannot tell you how much of a roller coaster this build has been. So I've done all of the sort of engraving on the inside of these calves, and the plan for each of these sections was to paint it with shielding paint. Now, the Crimson Guitar shielding paint is fantastic at doing that thing. It shields from electromagnetic radiation and stops noise and all that jazz because it has very, very, very high uh, graphite content. Graphite also happens to look very, very cool and very metallic. I've done a bit of a test. So that is the texture with shielding paint on it, which I did just as a test, just to make sure. And here is what that looks like. I'm pretty sure we've got our finish, aren't you? We're gonna get back to the body in a little while. I'm uh, thinking about rivets and things. Uh, in the meantime, the neck. 
Now I'm going to chop off the ends of all of the frets, do some fret end beveling. I don't have my crimson fret end beveling file here. I'm just going to use a leveling file and uh, uh, with my years of experience, get the angle correct. At that stage, you can hear the difference when I go off the metal and start uh, rounding the edge of the fretboard over. I do that a couple of times. I like it to be a little bit more comfortable, but don't take it too far. I think that a lot of the material that is in a neck doesn't necessarily have to be there. We do have, in all crimson guitars, guitars and kits, we do have carbon fiber stiffening rods. So I could go and I could change the shape quite drastically. It doesn't have to be a C shape, it could be faceted. Uh, I could, um, uh, when, when you're playing, you don't feel the whole thing. So I could carve a normal C shape and then what I was gonna do on this one is then route a channel down both sides. We won't necessarily feel it. Um, to, to remove weight and hopefully increase, you know, vibratory response. I'm not gonna do that. I'm actually gonna treat this neck very, very safely. Now, I'm not worried about neck dive. I'm gonna make the headstock relatively small. Um, once you have hardware and pickups and the, the piece of wood that's gonna be around the outside and rivets and all of that jazz, I'm not worried about neck dive. I'm going to take a fret end dressing file and I'm going to just tidy up the fret ends. So the fret end dressing file is a particularly fine little file. One side of it is flat, one side is slightly rounded. Flat to the fretboard, you just take the edge, the corner off the fret, and then with the rounded side that won't damage the fretboard, you round it over. and you end up with something that's nice and comfortable, easy to polish and attractive. With that done, I am gonna move on to carving in the neck. I'm going to be using a Japanese Shinto Sawrasp, one of the best tools ever made. We do sell them at crimsonguitars.com, go and check them out. I've been using them for probably coming up on 20 years now, and I think I've only gone through three. What you need to do. Okay, so that's your neck, that's your fretboard. Essentially, Here's your center line. You need to mark halfway down your center line and halfway to, to the fretboard. You'll then chop that off. Now, all of this is assuming that you have, uh, at least that, that that is your, say you want 22 millimeters at the nut, etc. So that needs to be correct first. Once you've taken that off, you then mark halfway between here and there. So halfway along that, halfway between those two points, and then you chop that off. Same thing here, halfway there, halfway there. Chop that off and you end up with pretty much a perfect C shape. You can take it even further. Uh, a lot of people will go to halfway up the fretboard or at least a millimeter into the fretboard and halfway there and just chop that off. I don't go that far. I don't like touching the edge of the fretboard. But essentially you're chopping a facet off, chopping a facet off, chopping a facet off, and you end up with, in this case, at that thickness, a U shape. But it'll do the job, won't it?
So I took a neck from rectangular to a carved neck in 10 minutes while listening to a watch podcast, while not thinking about carving a neck pretty much at all. I, that's not quite true because I do have to uh, get a rasp in and sort just the corners out, obviously. But the, the, the bit that counts and normally gives normal human beings, uh, including myself, a little bit of anxiety, it, it's there and it's done and it just, it, it's just a nothing. Uh, I remember in my early days spending uh, a couple of days carving a neck by hand. I mean, hell, that was faster than carving it with an angle grinder and a flap wheel. That will do for now. That will do for now. I'm avoiding the elephant in the room here, which is the headstock. Let's look at this neck then. Obviously, I need to put it in the, in the body and make that a little bit prettier. You can see I've got a, a bit of a flat spot down the center and the rest is fairly curved. In the final sanding, I'm gonna get rid of that flat spot and I'm just gonna round over the, the edge of the fretboard make it more comfortable because in the end the neck can look like whatever you want it to look like but if it isn't comfortable nobody's going to play the guitar my original plan was to glue this neck in and then you can go back and do more carving but in all seriousness it could be quite cool to do a bolt-on i very rarely do bolt-on necks how many bolts is the right number of bolts I wonder if I could get away with two. I could probably get away with one. A little bit more carving to do, and then onto the headstock. With these, I will be able to see where everything's going, how big the tuners are on the back, and I can design the headstock. So these are Schertler tuners. I use them fairly regularly anyway. They're nice tuners, but they're also fairly lightweight. We have started with a theme. So why don't we stick with it? We could just go that simple. We could potentially have a nice little curve. We could probably do something fun. What do you think? Am I going far enough? I'm not sure. There's a very simple, basic Martin style headstock, lightweight tuners. I think I'm just going to put a great big hole in the, uh, in the whole headstock and then eventually suspend a logo over the hole. I think that could look pretty cool. And of course, we're losing a little bit of weight. The eyes of tunes are in charge. It's very relaxing doing something that simple. You remember earlier when I said, hey, do you know what a corrugated sole plane looks like? Well, that. I completely forgot I actually had one here. There we go. Yes, I am a fool. We've got some cross-grained wood here. Those shavings were sublime. That is what you get with a good drill bit. These are Star M. Yeah, Star M made in Japan. Get them from um, Workshop Heaven. So putting that angle in there, makes it just a little bit prettier, for one, but also a teensy bit stronger. So, this isn't something one gets to do as a guitar builder very often. Yes, I think I got that pretty damn spot on. The reason why I drilled from one side and then t'other, that was a Somersetism, um, was to avoid tear out. Even when you're drilling the, <laughs> the tuner holes, uh, drill from one side, go halfway through, then having used a pilot hole drill from the other, and as long as you've got a good sharp drill bit, uh, you will be much, much less likely to have tear out.
All in all, I'm really rather happy with that. I'm going to have to do a similar texture in there to one of the two textures I've got on the body. A little bit of tidying up there with a the rasp, and we're good to go. This is going to get boring. I am going to sand down both the neck and what remains of the body to be sanded. Somebody, one of you fantastic people, made a comment and said, Ben, and I'm paraphrasing here, are you perhaps creating all of this texture to avoid sanding? Yes. That is entirely and solely why I did all of this. I mean, it took me many, 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 many more hours to put that texture into the guitar and it was a lot less fun than sanding, but <clears throat> nonetheless, here we are. Onwards. So here it is. These edges are sharp as. I'll sort those out later. I still have to put in the side dots, but the neck itself has been sanded down pretty much to perfection. That is not a pretty shape. I've left it fairly large for strength purposes. Some idiot took a chunk out of the headstock. Perfect truss rod access there. I am now going to level these frets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mask the fretboard off. First, use a notched straight edge to make absolutely certain that the neck itself is straight. And it is. Mask off the fretboard. The files have safe edges, but Shit happens. I'm going to get a permanent marker and put that on the top of the frets. Bear in mind, we skipped the first step because we did it earlier, i.e. use a fret end dressing file to dress all of the fret ends. Once you've got the masking on, it's more difficult to get to the bottoms and uh, becomes a problem. With proper support underneath your neck, if you have a, an angled headstock, and a quality fret leveling device, be it a Crimson Guitars fret leveling beam or a Crimson Guitars fret leveling file, no other brands will do. Uh, you level the frets. I am taking the top of the permanent marker off the frets, and if there is any left, then that means that that fret is lower than the rest. Uh, that basically means that I either skipped that bit or that is lower than the uh, frets on either side. One more pass, should sort that out. I'll use a fret rocker and just double check and see if you were right and justified. If it rocks and makes that sort of a noise, albeit quietly, then you've got a high or low fret somewhere there. This also helps to diagnose issues and obviously each different length goes all the way down the fretboard. When you are absolutely sure that your frets are all level and there are no high or low spots, back to the permanent marker and cover them frets up again. Traditional crowning file, I much prefer these over the modern uh, half round files because you can see what you're doing with the, with the other ones. You can't see the center of the fret. You can't see if you've gone down too low. Uh, if it's not the right size for the fret, then those tools will damage your fretboard. It, it's just a world of pain. Uh, I, I don't like them. So try and get a file with safe edges, ground. Uh, again, we make these at Crimson. But what you do is essentially we're making a flat topped pyramid, just with flat sides, flat side top. So Mayan pyramid. Anyway, it takes a little, a little bit of practice and you want to leave a nice, tiny little strip of untouched permanent marker. I start one third of the way up the file. I'll just keep it straight. So here's what you're after. Nice, thin, straight lines down the center of the fret and that gives you your intonation point. Now at this stage, you need to start polishing and this is the less fun bit. Uh, there are many, many different techniques if you wanna take it the slow and careful way. Uh, Crimson fret polishing rubbers are fantastic and get the mirror shine you require. I tend to start with 320 grit paper, 
than 600 grit, than 800 grit, wrapped around a credit card or something like that, and I use a fretboard protector. I start things off that way, I then move on to a fret rubber, and then finally go on to a bench grinder. Uh, not with that heavy duty cleaning wheel. The issue is polishing the sides of the frets. And once I'm happy that the, uh, the file marks are out of the sides, then I will go on to 600 grit and then fret rubbers and polishing. And that is that. I take off any excess jeweler's rouge uh, while the frets are still relatively warm from the polishing. My mind is probably gonna change, but really I think that that is the, that's the quickest way of doing a level crown and polish. The neck is pretty much done. I need to put in the side dots, which I'm getting uh, a bit later. I think I'm going to glue it in. I'm pretty sure I'm going to glue it to the body. This is my finish of choice for that internal section. Sneak preview of what the body's going to look like. All right, we'll have a look at that in the morning once it's cured. I have had a bit of a rest and 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 the, the, the last video just dropped. And I am not ashamed to say I gleaned a few ideas from from your comments. Uh, I try and reply to as many as humanly possible. Copper leaf was popular, as is me doing some stuff with CNC machines at some point. One of the ideas that stuck in my head was that I should copper leaf the insides of these and then do whatever I wanted with the texture. And what I want to do with the textured surface is use the uh, the rear guard shielding paint because I love the finish that you can get. But that means that uh, I need to see now if I can copper leaf over <laughs> rear guard shielding paint. The reason why I love the look of this is that much like pencil lead on your fingers as a child, um, when you rub it down, you get a, a metallic ceramic-y kind of a look. And and I think it looks amazing. It is a very cool finish. So what we're gonna end up with is this almost pewtery, silvery, blacky kind of a feel mixed with copper leaf. This headstock isn't going to match the, the maple. It just isn't. So what I'm going to do is sand the edges down because that's, I mean, sharp enough to kill somebody. Uh, and then I'm going to create the same texture on the front and the back of the headstock as we have on the inside of this and the inside of the cavities. I'm then going to paint that with the shielding paint. We're going to have a very interesting texture and also, you know, it'll look cool. And then Later on, we're going to play with, um, I'm wondering if I might have to just spray a sealing coat or put some shellac on there first. But uh, yeah, I'm going to see about copper leafing that. Before anything else happens, protection. More protection. Before I put any paint on this fantastic texture, I need to sign the guitar. While that cures, 
I am going to make an irrevocable decision. I am going to be painting uh, all of this. I'm just flooding it with the uh, shielding paint. I am absolutely confident that I will be able to leaf over it. When you're applying anything onto a guitar, be it stain or whatever, the substrate makes a big difference. If I've got black under parts of it and no black under other bits of it, that's gonna, it's gonna look different. So I'm, I'm just painting everything that is gonna be painted. I'm gonna go through a few bottles of this. Okay. <clears throat> yes, I'm covered in, in shielding paint. I am now a Faraday cage. This is a little bit messy. Yes, Talitha, I am touching the camera. Uh, you, you, you'll be all right, wash us off. The guitar is currently in a bit of a state. That's gonna be supremely cool. I have only go and gone through two and a half bottles of the shielding paint, so that's cool. Honestly, well, I think this is the end of this episode. I have one episode left to finish this guitar. And at the moment, what I have is a multitudinous pile of sticky mess. That's a terrible sentence. I have got to get this together. I have got it to get it looking stunning. It has to look stunning. And yet I chose to do this in a completely unconventional way. I don't currently regret that in the slightest. Uh, I've got to get the wiring and I've got to get the pickups in. I am still planning something special for the hardware. Uh, well, it's all coming down to the wire. It is currently a quarter to nine on Sunday evening. This video is going live on the Tuesday. The final video is going live on Friday the 4th. This whole competition is, is, is hotting up. It's incredible. Um, I, I hoped that it was gonna be cool. I hoped that it was gonna be big and interesting. My goodness. This is one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. Um, next year, I'm gonna give myself a little bit longer to build the guitar, maybe. Anyway, click like, subscribe. Go and subscribe to everybody else who is doing both the main competition and the great guitar build along. And uh, if you fancy entering into the sub competition, the prizes are pretty cool. I'll see you soon. Goodbye.